So Misha Woods from at the half is going to talk about quantum clocks. That's the title. Uh, so well, that's yeah. No, it's not quite the title. It's like a pre. <laughs> but there was like a pre. Uh, so I guess that would oh, be the general relativistic yeah. time dilation and increased well, uncertainty yeah. in generic quantum clocks. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the. Um, uh, the, the invitation to be here, and it's great to, to meet you all. So um, yeah, the reason why this is not actually the title of the talk is because there's a few minutes uh, where I kind of just introduce myself and my kind of my research directions. Uh, since I think n not many of you are familiar with myself, I thought it would be good to do that before I jump into the specifics of the paper that I will talk about. Um, yeah, so the title will appear in a few minutes <laughs> on here. Um, okay. Yeah, good. So as I said, so um, my roughly, very roughly speaking, my research um, uh, in the of the past uh, uh, year to two years previously, and of the the previous in the next uh, few years, kind of revolves around the the topic of quantum clocks. Um, and this is uh, there's many different aspects, as I guess you can imagine within within uh, within this name. And many different uh, from a, uh, different objects, which from a mathematical point of view are very different, uh, and but you can roughly speaking, people refer to as, as clocks in some way or another. So um, you can more or less divide my research into these kind of subfields. So one thing is like the characterization and, and performance. So here we look at like ticking clocks that really uh, emit information to the outside. Um, and we can characterize how could they can be as a function of, say, dimensionality or entropy and, and things like that. Uh, and then we have stopwatch clocks. Um, and so that's, yeah, and that's uh, one line of research. Uh, and then I put down here at the end in italic some kind of direction which may, may or maybe not it would lead to in, in the end, some kind of more uh, general vision. Um, uh, so that's one thing. And then there's like... Uh, General relativistics effects, so like uh, the pr prediction of quantum uh, general relativity effects, and perhaps maybe design experiments to determine some of these things. Um, then there's applications to in quantum information theory. So it turns out that um, lots of these uh, ideas and, and, and mathematical uh, techniques and things developed for clocks are also useful for solving problems which may or may not, depending on your background, a priori seem related or unrelated, but, but it turns out they are related. Um, this is more also in the, in the kind of general relation of um, reference frames as clocks and as a, a U1 um, reference frame, and then, of course, you can have this in more general groups in this context as well, so like UN and et cetera, et cetera. So here for like um, error correction, quantum non deletion and these things are, are related. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards, not forwards. <laughs> um, something we've heard about today. Uh, <laughs> um, so, okay, and then there's, uh, say, quantum firm dynamics as well. So it turns out as well that clocks are understanding, clocks are useful here. We can ask questions like, are uh, thermal operations really free or not? And it turns out here you can like, in include an agent which has to turn on and off these unitaries, and then because it wants to in a particular time, this agent has to be or at least include the clock. So the, here these clocks play a kind of active rather than passive role, and I have research uh, in these directions and papers down here. So some of these things, the bullet points, are either things I'm thinking about or things on the archive or, or, or things like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have questions like that. And then from foundation's point of view, I have some work in this direction that's coming out soon as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of... Uh, in a nutshell, me and my research over the, the recent uh, period of time. Okay, uh, and this talk will be about this particular aspect here. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, okay, good. So, yeah, this is now the title of, of the talk. Uh, it's a little bit more specific than, than the uh, earlier one. Uh, and this is uh, work with myself and, and these, uh, my co-authors. Shishia, who um, was a, a master student at, PD, uh, at ETH uh, uh, under my supervision while this work was uh, being done, um, uh, who is now a, a PhD student at the University of Geneva. Um, Max Locke uh, is, a, is a postdoc in uh, Vienna in the group of Markus Huber. 
uh, and I myself uh, um, on a TTH. Uh, and, and yeah, so this is the free print I'll be talking about here. Um, okay, so, so what is time? Uh, there are many answers to this. One answer I think Carlo Rivelli will tell us about tomorrow, which I'm looking forward to. Um, we, on the other hand, are taking a more, in, in this talk, a more operational approach. So we're not going to think about uh, philosoph philosophical aspects of time. Uh, that's not because they're not interesting, but just because that's not what this work is about. Um, and here we'll take a, um, uh, a uh, as I said, operational point of view. So we will say that time is what is measured by a clock. Um, and actually, uh, this is also the, the approach that GR takes, for example, as well. There are many theories that take this kind of approach. So especially if you read the more early works of uh, Einstein, he talks about measuring, measuring rods and, and clocks. Although, of course, there's no, nothing quantum about this. Everything is, here is classical. Uh, there's a good uh, 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 a paper you can read by this author about the, the logic of uh, modern physics. Uh, it's quite old, but still quite good. So, okay, so what about in GR? So in GR, normally uh, um, we have some observer that has his own, or her, or it, I guess, uh, world line. Um, uh, and, and he, she, or it will have a, a clock along that world line, and then time is, is what's marked by, by their clock. Uh, and then the time that they the, he, she, or it will observe is normally given by the, some integral over some function over some, some world line. Um, okay, but then as uh, a lot of you, if not all of you in this room, know very well in, in quantum theory, uh, in, in non-relativistic quantum theory, we uh, take a very different approach. And we all tell, at least most of us tell undergraduate that there's no time operator. Uh, it's just a parameter. Um, this is very different to the other observables in quantum mechanics, say position and, um, or energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's just some parameter which, um, uh, which we have in, in this differential equation we call the Schrodinger equation, which tells us how our state evolves in time, right? So moves forward. Um, and you may ask, what is the origin of this statement? So um, as far as I can see, uh, tracing back to literature, lots of the references point to Wolfgang Pauli, because he actually uh, asked, you know, can you have a time observable in quantum mechanics? Or in other words, does there exist a, a perfect clock or a self-adjoint operator uh, observable T and a Hamiltonian such that in Heisenberg picture, the derivative of this operator with respect to parameter T is, is the identity operator. Because if you have that, then you can have, uh, basically, if you look at the, the, strolling, the, the, the state at time T, then the, the parameter T is uh, the eigenstate of this. Or at least if you choose your initial state to be delta correlated, I, even if it's not delta correlated, the, the standard deviation is constant in time. Or when you, if you measure, it doesn't increase. And it can be made arbitrarily small by choosing the initial wave function of the uh, repeat. Um, anyway, so as I was saying a minute ago, oops, sorry, I'm not very good at pressing the buttons in the wrong way. Um, uh, as I said a minute ago, so, but, um, so what, what did Wolfgang conclude? So he concluded uh, no, because the only solution uh, up to unitary equivalence is. Uh, according to Pauli, is that time is, is like the position operator of a of one particle in um, in a, sorry, a free particle in one dimension with a Hamiltonian which is given by the momentum operator of that observable. And he the reason why he said no, even though he found a, a mathematical solution, is because while this is uh, mathematically valid, he argued that it's physically uh, sorry physically invalid because this operator. Uh, is unbounded from below. So he's saying that the only solution has, doesn't have a ground state, so it's some physical called physical systems must have a ground state, or to put it differently, it's kind of like saying you need infinite energy in, in some sense, um, because yeah, ground state is at minus infinity. Um, so later on, there were, the, depending who you ask, but um, there are some critics to, to what uh, Pauli concluded. Uh, these authors and among, among others. And what they pointed out is that, um, uh, so Pauli's solution basically, uh, the, the time operator and the Hamiltonian um, form um, uh, uh, 
have a canonical commutation relation as our x and p. Uh, but the solution he found was of the so-called Wiley form, or Wiley form. I'm not, I'm not sure how to pronounce that word properly, but anyway, Wiley, Wiley, or, or something like that, is of this form. Um, but these people pointed out there's a more general solution to the canonical uh, uh, more general solution to the canonical uh, commutation relations, which is known as the Heisenberg form, which includes this as a special case. And here, it, you can have um, a momentum operator that's, that's bounded from below. Uh, th these clocks are necessarily periodic, so they repeat themselves every now and again, but then we have lots of clocks that you know, repeat themselves uh, on a daily basis or twice a day even, uh, like 20, 12 hours. So, um, so it's not an issue. Um, however, people then pointed out as well that these solutions necessarily seem to require uh, confinement of the wave function. So that the, so the probability of the wave function then being outside of a certain region has to be strictly zero. Or in other words, you need an infinite potential. So people argue that the infinity is just sort of hidden in, in terms of a potential rather than in, in the ground state. So. You, people um, still argue backwards and forwards whether there is a time operator in quantum mechanics. Um, but we won't get into those nitty-gritty details too much. They won't bother us um, that much. Um, because uh, we will try and describe um, uh, a generic, uh, try and describe as, as much as possible, a generic quantum clock. Um, because we want to try and make as much as possible universal statements about um, relativistic effects in measuring time. So uh, we want to try and you know, include everything. And, and that means as well including clocks that may have some, some errors. They, they may be very accurate, they may be completely inaccurate, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to try and find a way to, to account for that. Uh, and what we, then the framework we have uh, is the following. So we'll, the, the clocks we'll consider are kind of like stopwatch clocks in the sense that um, they have some initial state, some, some evolution, and then there's some rule that tells us how we can measure it. And, and the goal, if you want, of these clocks is to try and have the outcomes that are as close as possible to the parameter t in the, in the Schrodinger equation. Um, so these could be projective measurements or more general some POVMs. So S could be the real line or some subset of the real line, and, and S would be the outcome of, of the, of the POV, POVM element F L of S. Um, um, and then, of course, in order, it turns out to be useful to, to characterize this in terms of what we call an error operator. Uh, and we define this as the deviation from the, from the idealized case, where X and P are just um, position momentum operators. So, um, so we say the, here, this is the, 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 the defining equation of epsilon, which again, for every clock, if you want non-relativistic clock, um, this defines a uh, epsilon of uh, E of t. Um, and it turns out that this E of t can characterize uh, often the, the error. So, so I said this t now, because we, we have more general POVMs, we can define in this way here as just the first moment of the POVM. So in the case of projective measurements, this is just like the time observable, and, and otherwise it's a bit more general. But um, we can characterize uh, this, error op this error operator via this relation. Um, so you assume that uh, ah. there's a better state independent that's no, operator? No, no, no. It, it oh, sorry, no. So, so, that every, so for every initial state, every Hamiltonian, every, uh, uh, um, PO, every family of POVM elements that add up to identity, we define uh, e, of, e of t. Yeah. So, so it depends on the initial state as well. Because that's what we think of as our clock. So the, you give me one of these sets, and that's a clock class. Everything here is non-relativistic. We will add the relativity uh, later. Yeah? Um, and for example, it's useful to, to characterize properties of, of the clock. For example, the expectation value of, this, uh, of, of, of the POVMs, which in this case is just the expectation value of, of, of this. Uh, so it's basically, I'm saying here, you, you, you have the initial state, you let it evolve, and then you measure your POVMs, and on average, this is what you'll get. So it's easy to show, show this from here, which is, so if the clock were perfect or idealized, this would be zero, and you would be t, okay? So, I'm, so it, there's an initial condition here that at t equals zero, it's, it's zero, but so, so, so you would have this. But this, in some sense, it shows that there's <coughs> some imperfection. It characterizes the, the imperfection to the average, and, and, and for other observables, too. This will be an important quantity in later equations, we'll see. Um, okay. 
So yeah, so to give you some, some examples, um, uh, we'll give some examples of, uh, of how, uh, of, of clocks in the literature and, and how this error operator uh, turns out to be in those cases. So perhaps one of the, the uh, earliest example is this, where I and some other people refer to as the saleka wigner Perez clock, uh, which was developed by, uh, by these people in, in respective years. And it's a very simple concept, so it's just you, the Hamiltonian is a truncated harmonic oscillator, or, or at least of, or, or the first D levels of a harmonic, uh, uh, hom yeah, harmonic, sorry, quantum harmonic oscillator. Um, and then uh, the initial state, yeah, sorry, you have a question? Ah, oh, sorry, okay, I thought there was a question. Uh, and then the initial state of the clock is just a pure state, um, so it doesn't really matter which value of k you pick, so k is just some integer, say, say zero. Or, or one, and then these are, it's defined by taking the, the Fourier transform basis of the energy basis, okay? Um, and we can intuitively see why, and then we measure as well that the time operators just measure projectively in, in this uh, Fourier transform basis, okay? So intuitively we can see why this kind of makes a, a clock because uh, if, if we start off, uh, say this should be, I oh know we start off at 12, yeah, okay, fair enough. So if we start off at 12, uh, then, okay, um, this error, so this, it turns out that for these, this, that these states, this is zero, so this error up is minus one, and optimally we would want this to be zero, so for these particular states it's, it's not so good, but um, if we evolve this for uh, one diff period, so here I'm giving an example where d equals 12, so if we evolve this from, from diff period, it just goes from this state to, to the state correspond to one o'clock and three o'clock, so it evolves nicely uh, in between. Although the, the error, this error operator is quite large, and the reason is because I said a minute ago for all these, uh, for all these particular times, this commutator, when, when evaluated on the states, is exactly zero, which, and zero is very different to one, which is the case you'll get if it was the identity. Um, and then um, the problem is as well is that the reason why it turns out to be quite bad is because for so I didn't put the slide here, I think, but for times in between these particular times, so not uh, integer values of, of the, of the uh, fractions of the period, but sometime in between, then what happens is that the, the state is very spread out. So with high probability, uh, it will be like half past one, but it, you will measure it to be nine o'clock. So it's not even that with high probability it's nearby, it kind of spreads out. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's to summarize that one. It's a very really bad, huh? really bad clock. It's a very bad clock, yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, it's one of the first people, people came up with, thought about, and it's, it's amazing if you happen to measure exactly at the right moment, that any other, and these are point, these are measure zero of all time, so there you go. So you want to... You have a better to clock to measure exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So then what I, I, I so this is just, so then, um, I forget his first name, I think uh, Julio would, pardon? Uh, Ado, okay, so Ado Buzek and co-authors in 1999 came up, okay, this is me, <laughs> this is the first time I've called it this and you won't see any else called that, I just called it a sine clock because uh, in the energy basis, the coefficients form a sine distribution, okay, so probably there's better names for this, but um, maybe I should just refer to it as the names of the authors, but anyway, for, for the, the point of discussion, it forms a sine distribution, and, and this is actually now much better because you, at the particular times corresponding to, to this measure zero of times uh, I showed before, then it, there is some distribution, but at least more or less you'll get the right time. But the key point is that all the times in between, then with high probability, if it's say 130, you'll measure either um, that it was 12 or that it was two. So it won't, it, it, it's, it's good in that sense. Um, and this is now reflected in the sense that the, this error uh, uh, goes, goes, to, goes to zero as the dimension gets large. Um, for, and, and that is not true for this one, because this is one in respect of the dimension for those particular times. So, so this, at least, as the dimension gets large, it gets very good. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and then you can, turns out you can do even better if you have, uh, at least for this, for this particular, the, the, um, for this particular task, in other tasks that's not necessarily true, but for this particular class, uh, task, you can uh, have these types of clock, which are now Gaussian distribution, uh, and I've evaluated it here for the case where the coefficients are 
that the, the amplitude of the Gaussian is, is up to small corrections is the same in both the energy basis and the Fourier transform basis. So, um, because we know that going from the energy basis to, your Fourier transform, uh, to the Fourier transform basis, essentially it's like you take a discrete Fourier transform, uh, and the Fourier transform of the Gaussian is another Gaussian, but this is the one where the width coincides in both cases. Um, so we could talk more about this, but for the point of this talk, this is probably sufficient, and here the error goes down, oops, sorry, goes down like this. So th these errors also scale like this in, in one norm as well, not just absolute value of the trace, but I just put the trace for comparison and because that's the relevant quantity in, in the other slide. Um, good, okay, so, so our approach is, is now, you know, when we want to make these things relativistic, uh, so as I say, we want to kind of have a relativistic framework now for any one of these non-relativistic clocks, which is characterized by this initial state, this Hamiltonian, these POVMs. Um, so the approach is basically you take um, the, like the uh, general relativistics equation for time dilation when you have a point particle moving under the influence of weak gravity um, uh, slowly, so it's so, uh, so low velocity. And then what you do is you expand that to leading order C and you quantize, so you promote energy to Hamiltonians and positions to um, the position operators and momentum to momentum operators, um, like that. Oops, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong buttons. Uh, so this approach was, I think, to some extent, it was around before, but it was mainly pioneered and, and um, made ready available by, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of your name now. It's, it's lost my, my head. <laughs> uh, Chaflad, yes, Chaflad Bruckner and, and his group and uh, his team and, and co-authors, like one of the first papers that got my attention on this is this universal decoherence due to gravita gravitational time defect where basically what they do is they, they have a bipartite system and they, they see that gravity uh, means that the, the system of interest is coupled to, its, um, to other degrees of freedom and then you get decoherence. Um, and it's universal because gravity is, you can't turn it off, right? So this kind of effect you have, in some sense, when you have any object is, you know, just some Hamiltonian, some interaction in terms of other thing, but this is kind of fundamental, uh, whereas the others maybe not so, okay? And then um, and another work, uh, as, as we see here. Um, okay, so so the, the, as I said, the framework is basically we, we take these, um, post-Newtonian metric um, uh, and, uh, the, and, and we just expand this, um, um, the, the, the classical gravitational field of a, of a, of a sphere around, you know, there's a, the approximate uh, expansion around the, around the point, R0. Um, and this gives the, the standard, you know, textbook um, time dilation uh, where we have effects due to, uh, this, this, is to, to this is to leading order, so I'm, I've neglected how all the terms in, in one over C. So we have the, the correction due to some, it some, has some velocity, that should be a V naught, so it has some velocity V naught, and then we have the gravitational effects, and this gives to time dilation um, for the clock in, in, the, in, its, in its proper frame um, compared with the time in the lab frame, so if you have some like clock on the wall. Um, so how do we now ap approach the, the problem? So basically we, we take the, the full momentum and then we can um, form the, the, the scalar by contracting with itself. And this scalar is invariant um, in the different uh, reference frames. So that allows us to derive a relationship between the energy in the lab and the energy in the rest frame. Um, then again, we can expand uh, expand the, the rest energy in terms of um, uh, the, 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 well, what's known as the rest mass and, the, and, and some energy due to internal degrees of freedom, which again, if it's a clock, it must have because it has to evolve in time, so there must be some, uh, some internal kinematic degrees of freedom. Um, and yeah, so just to summarize, it's kind of the, the procedure I said a minute ago, um, and a good Review of this is um, the thesis of um, uh, Ma Mary Z uh, Ma Magdalena. Yes, that's good. I'm glad you're here. You can fill in the names for me. My, I, I don't remember names. 
um, marginalizing. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. So we 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 making these assumptions here. Um, okay. So when you do all of that, um, now we can characterize that the Hilbert space has been by part type. So it's, uh, there's the clock part, and this is where we have our um, if you want the the, the, the the this is the 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 degree of freedom we associate with measuring time that, that evolves that I was talking about on the previous slides. But now there's also the, the kinematic degrees of freedom of, of the clock. Um, and the resulting uh, and resulting Hamiltonian from this quantization procedure is of this form. So it's a local clock term. That's this Hamiltonian here. You have the a kinematic part and you have some interaction part. Um, and to leading order, the kinematic part is of this form, and the interaction term uh, is of this form here. So um, now the, the procedure will be um, let the clock evolve unitarily according to, uh, I'm sorry, that should be the full Hamiltonian H there as a typo. So we just let it evolve unitarily. Um, we then measure the clock with some POVMs. Um, and then in here, the, the Strollinger form time is, is, the, is the lab time, the time of in, in the lab. And then what we measure, the expectation value of what we measure will be the, the time in the rest frame of, of the clock. Um, and what we, what we find, what we derive, is, is this expression <coughs> here. So we find that, um, and we do this generically, so with not, not, not to any examples here, so this is completely general. Uh, we have a non-relativistic uh, term, which is the term I showed you on one of the early slides. Which, uh, and then we have um, this, if you want, this relativistic factor that only depends on, on relativistic effects, both uh, gravity and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the velocity. Uh, and then this is multiplied by one, but plus we have this non-relativistic error term, which is basically you know, depends on how accurate your clock is. Okay. Um, which in some sense makes sense because now um, in the case of an idealized clock, um, which is kind of in some sense the clocks you have in GR, right, where, where, where the, the clocks are, there's no error when you measure the clock, at least that's what Einstein assumed, then this is zero. So if you put this, this, um, the, this, or this term is zero and this is just T, and then, um, yeah, and then you get exactly this correction. So... Um, it's nice that it factors out in this, in this neat form. Um, so now what you can do is you can evaluate the kinematic degree of freedom for a, a wave packet, um, this Gaussian wave packet, and then this term just becomes uh, this term here, which, um, if we, which we can compare, oops, sorry, which we can compare um, with the, the, the prediction from you know, the standard uh, non-quantum relativity. Uh, and I've written in this form to, to kind of compare with this. And what we find is that if we identify, so, so I should say actually, this Gaussian has um, a mean, uh, the, the expect expectation value in, in, in momentum is just P naught bar. Uh, sigma P is the standard deviation of the Gaussian in, in momentum. Uh, and X naught is the initial position, okay, of this, of this Gaussian. So now if we compare that to the prediction of general relativity, and if we identify this as with V naught, we see that um, every term is, is the same up to this term here, which you can think of just some, it's just to the, it's just to some, the fact that there's some probabilistic probability of, of where you measure, you know, where you, where you find the, the momentum because it's not like a, a point particle. It hasn't got um, strictly deterministic momentum. So, um, so this allows us, so, to conclude, in some sense, that um, that all quantum clocks, at least within this framework, uh, do experience time dilation, and it corresponds with what the um, the theory predicts. At least when you have like a, a, a stand a Gaussian wave packet or, or like a classical state of motion, um, and this is good. It's in some sense you can see as a sanity check, and in others it's just um, a nice result. Um, and it's nice because there was a, a paper in the archive not too recently that said that uh, quantum clocks do not, do not uh, with a classical state, do not experience time dilation. And in some sense, it shows that they do. So, um, yeah, that's just good. 
Um, yes. So I think that's anyone would say. Um, then, then what you can now consider is if your wave packet, uh, if your initial, if, if the initial state of motion is some superposition of two uh, two initial wave packets, um, where each each wave packet is is um, is, is the same, uh, well, it has the same standard deviation. It's just moved in, in position a bit. The initial state is, is, is separated by delta x. Um, and we'll assume, for, for, for what I'll show here, just for simplicity, uh, we'll assume that we have good clocks, i.e. this is approximately zero, just to keep the maths simple. Um, but you can write expressions otherwise. Uh, and what we've, uh, and uh, you can then write the, the uh, if you let the system evolve, and then you measure your, your clock, uh, we, we have an expression of this form, so we have, uh, we have two, we, we've broken the expression to two contributions. This one we call classical, uh, and, it's, and it's simply defined as the probabilistic mixture um, according to this weighting of the, um, of the results, the result you would get for the expectation value if you only had one Gaussian. So the result I showed you on the other side, on, on the previous slide. Um, and in some sense, this is what if these were, if you just had some, you know, that you f yeah, if you got a coin and you flipped it and with some probability you prepared this state and you have to do that state, then in GR you would expect to get, you know, an expectation value of time like this simply because of the probability, right? So this is kind of what you would expect to go into GR. And then we see that we have this, what we call a quantum correction. Um, pardon? Interference. Yes, yes. Uh, that's another way of saying it, um, which is, yeah, <laughs> so you, you predicted, uh, you uh, did some time traveling and went back. So, so yeah, um, you get the term which, uh, which involves um, interference between uh, uh, these two, two wave packets. And what we see here is that, um, for, uh, for example, it's kind of as you would expect, because as if delta x goes to infinity, then the, the, uh, the overlap goes to zero, and this goes to zero, because this becomes exponentially <coughs> large. Uh, conversely, in the limit where delta x goes to zero, then you have no superposition anymore, because it's, uh, it's the same state. And this is also zero, because of the, the x multiplying here. Um, similarly, if the probability is zero and one, then, then um, it collapses to zero. So it kind of behaves in some sense how you would imagine. Um, of course, a key question here is, could one experimentally detect this? Um, so this is a lot of work in, in progress, but um, um, as to just plug in some, some numbers, so maybe you should take this with a pinch of salt. I know it's just taking some numbers from the literature and plugging them in, so um, this is not so much of a careful analysis, but if you choose an equal weighting of the, of the supposition, and then some delta x. Uh, so this is for, I said, an aluminium atom. Uh, and this is the van der Waals radius of aluminium. So you choose uh, basically a, a separation of two, two atoms. Uh, sorry, a, a standard deviation of two atoms, a, a, a separation of like four atoms, roughly speaking, a time of one second. Then, um, and, and a coherence time of one second is in some experiments is achievable. This types of separation, there's also another experiment to achieve coherence over superpositions in height. So these have been done in different contexts and different experiments. Um, then you get a T coherence of 10 to the, of all the 10 to the minus 16, which um, is in principle, if you look at the numbers people can measure in atomic clocks, it is it's a reasonable number. So it doesn't seem, a priori it doesn't seem um, completely silly that this would be measurable. But I say again, maybe take a pinch of salt because these are just, some numbers out of a textbook. So it's uh, probably when it comes to real experiments, things may be different. But um, it's, it's encouraging to, I think it's good encouragement to look further, to investigate this further. Um, yeah, okay, good, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm told I have five minutes. So I'll, I'll just go on to quickly um, cover the other thing we look at in, in the, in the, pre in the uh, preprint which is, and, and this for simplicity, we do for just special relativity, so we say G to gravity is zero, but we think qualitatively you have similar behavior you'll have with G is non-zero. Um, and to do these calculations, now this is the, the standard deviation in, in what you would 
measure um, in, in the time in the in the in the measurements we make of time. Um, and for this, we have to go one order higher in in the in the terms we keep in order to do the computation. But we, after lots of lots of pages of maths, you can do this, and the actual final expression is not too complicated, so we can write it down. And then we break this into three terms. So there's the uh, non-relativistic term, which is just the expectation value of the clock if there was no coupling to to gravity or zero you know zero motion. Um, and this is just due to the fact that uh, you have some you know, standard deviation. Uh, as I said, in the case of like uh, an idealized clock, this will be zero because it measures time perfectly. Um, and then we have a term which uh, still, we, this, this term here, um, I stands for idealized. So even in the case of a, a perfect clock, if you want, the, the solution that Pauli found where x and so position and um, Sorry, where time is the position and h is the momentum. This term still, you will still have this additional term due to the coupling with, with gravity. And this is a term which only depends on this error term epsilon. So if we have an, if the error term is zero, then this vanishes. But this term, in some sense, is, is still important even if you don't have good clocks. Uh, and the important thing to take away here is that it depends at least to, to, uh, to this order in the approximation that grows quadratically in, in time. Um, so um, one thing, so in, in some sense what this is saying is that due to the coupling of the internal degrees of freedom to the kinematic degrees of freedom, even in the case of like an idealized clock, some of the information about time is leaking out to the um, kinematic degrees of freedom. So then you can ask, what happens if I, if I measure the kinematic degrees of freedom just before or at the same time as I measure the clock, will I retrieve this information? Can I make my, my clock more accurate? And it turns out that the answer is uh, yes. So to probe this, we just look at um, some, um, uh, so we, we measure in the momentum basis the, the kinematic degrees of freedom. And, and these are some POVM uh, elements uh, labeled by n. So the, the complete set is for, for all integers n. Uh, and basically what we're doing is just binning the momentum into the discrete bins of length delta uh, delta, delta P. So in the limit delta P goes to zero, this is just um, perfect momentum measurements. In the limit delta P goes to infinity, this is the identity. So that's a one way to characterize no information or all information about you know, the, the momentum of the thing. And then you can plot the standard deviation, so it's for the idealized clock, uh, as a function of um, of Q, so another thing as well, it's not just delta P that matters, but it's also the width of the initial uh, in momentum space of initial Gaussian, which you imagine if it's very strict, um, it, it's this ratio that's the kind of relevant thing, because it's very wide, then there's also lots of uncertainty, it's very narrow, then there's not. And as you can see, um, so I said as, as Q uh, tends to infinity, that corresponds to, um, uh, the identity, so no information retrieval, and we get the quadratic scaling that I mentioned here, because this term is, it, we recover this equation, basically. Um, and then in the opposite limit where Q goes to zero, we see it approaches a constant, uh, and that means that this term is essentially vanishes, and we're just left with this term, which, as I said, because uh, of the, in the case of the idealized clock, uh, it's just a constant, because the standard deviation only depends on the initial state, it doesn't grow with time. That's why you get a constant here. Okay, so with that, uh, yeah, I finish. So basically, I think theirs came out like a month before ours came no, out. What, what, what so was their logic? So there, I, I think, okay, so it's interesting because now the, the paper, they've changed the title, so it doesn't say that anymore in the title on the, on the archives. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, so... It sound good. Yeah, it, it, I think that the thing is they were looking at a very particular type of clock, 
and coming up quickly, you'll see this like Asha Pillars plot. And because the airway is very large, it makes it appear like there's no time dilation, which really I think is disincluding this error term. Yeah. So I think that's kind of there was another there's another aspect to it that I yeah, there's there's that and there's some some other aspect of it as well. But I uh, later discussed with some of the authors and they agree with this at least, this analysis. Okay. So it's kind of um, yeah, they I think it's it's partly a bit of a misconfusion and then also that they didn't quite mean mean it literally, so that's kind of literally what it says, but they kind of meant it in some other way. Yes. Uh, about about the, the the different clocks you mentioned, is there, is there a bound on how good a clock you can make, for example, with a d-dimensional system? Yes. So um, so yes. Yeah, so actually, this is very important, especially when it comes to the um, to those numerical numbers I plugged in, because this was assumed an idealized clock, so let's assume this e term is neglectable, right? Um, which, if you choose. Uh, uh, so, for example, the quasi-ideal clock I put up there before, the error, you can put the error decayed exponentially quickly in the dimension. So this would, with a, I haven't actually calcul I could calculate numbers, but I haven't done this, so, but it deca decayed exponentially, and the coefficients in front won't be that large. So I think with a rel relatively modest dimension, it's already uh, neglectable. The question is, can you construct such a state? Um, and then, yeah, and other things as well. I mean, experimentally, it's also, I think one of the main, to my understanding of atomic clocks, one of the main limitations on their accuracy is, uh, for them, is is keeping these uh, energy, these what what I put here as constant energy levels really constant, right? Because of magnetic fields and things. And of course, here I'm assuming these are really just constants. But on, on a theoretical level, has it been proven that you cannot do anything better than that, for example, in uh, each dimension? No. Oh, I see. Um, no, my, my guess is that the, those states, those quasi-ideal states, are probably not optimal. And if they, they, I think they have the optimal scaling for this problem, but they are probably for fixed dimension. There's probably something that's not a Gaussian, but in the limit tends to a Gaussian. My, my, my feeling gap in there is kind of optimal. But I haven't really looked in here, but I don't think it's such an important aspect of the, of the problem. Um, but the exponential scaling is optimal. The exponential scaling with dimension is the optimal scaling. You cannot do better than that. I, I don't have a proof of that. I think that's probably the case, but that's just me. That's just a gut feeling. I don't have any proof. Um, I have reasons from other work I've done in quantum firm dynamics to believe that that's the case, because I think otherwise you wouldn't have a third law. <laughs> and that's another story to go. Um, you should discuss if you want. But um, from this analysis, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be better. But then from other work I've done using similar frameworks, it feels like it has to, you can't get better than exponential encoding. Um, the, the reason why we call this quasi-ideal plot, I think I mentioned it, is because uh, it kind of mimics a lot of the properties of this X and P. So, so for this work, the, the, the clock doesn't have to be coupled to an, another system in the interaction term. Uh, well, it, okay, it is coupled directly, but it's, um, you, you kind of measure it. Um, but at least for the non relativistic case, it's not coupled way. So there's other work where it has to be coupled, and then you can mimic the coupling of the idealized block as well. So it adds a, if you couple um, in position, you add a phase factor. And this also mimics that to good accuracy. So one last question about that. So, so um, my question is pretty generic from the point of view of uh, constructing the time operator and uh, this stuff which makes sense in this setup. Uh, have you, uh, do you have any ideas of uh, doing something similar uh, in the sense to construct the operator or position of space, space uh, coordinate, not type coordinate? Uh -huh. So like a, dis a discrete position operator? Well, uh, yes, something that would be able to measure you know, the spatial distance, not, not the spatial coordinate, not the type coordinate. Uh -huh. You mean for, you would want this for a different context or for the same context for measuring time? No, it's the same context. I mean, the time is a part of, the time is yeah. a, a coordinate in, in space time. So yeah. I, if, if I want to, ah. if I have a, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. some kind of a curve, a line yeah. in space time, then you, you, you can parameterize the curve by, by yeah. constructing this operator. If I have some, some surface or something like that, which has both space and time coordinates, ah. then I want to have two parameters, two operators to, to parameterize a point. Right? So, I see, yeah. uh, so in that sense, I would want uh, this operator and another one, which would depend on, which would be a, like, uh, 
and, yeah. I see. And, and this is on the same space, it's not on a tensor product space, right? They both live on the same number space. Well, yeah, the, 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 yeah. The, the, I mean, it is a space time coordinates, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so you have like, uh, I mean, yeah. for, for manifold, you, 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 okay, in quantum mechanics, it's a mechanical theory. You have only T as a parameter, right? In field theory, you have T, X, Y, and Z. So, mm -hmm. so, so I, I would want to have an operator for each of those. Yeah, okay, so I haven't thought about this at all. Um, but here you you are you work in infinite dimensions, right? So should we yeah. Uh, I, I would imagine that if, if whatever you can do in the infinite dimensional case, so it, like the the the, 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 the poly if you want solution is mathematically well defined, it's just physically not very well motivated, right? So right. come down to that. So in your setup I think whatever you can do, if you can, I, I would first approach that problem as looking what you can do in the dimensional case, which is mathematically easier to work with. And then if for whatever reason, maybe the solution is not physical or for another reason you want to work in finite dimensions, I would then try and find finite dimensional approximations of that, rather than starting the finite dimensional. I think that's the easiest way to go. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a speaker again. Thank you.